Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We're studying a new series now. This is lesson number two in that series entitled, Here We Stand, Luther on Romans. This lesson is entitled, The Controversy. It's a lesson for October 14 of 2017, and it's basically a background lesson, a second background lesson, to help us understand some of the major issues in the Book of Romans. I think you'll find it very, very useful if you haven't studied this recently. So let's jump into it. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we once again take up our docu documents and, and look at this uh, record to try to understand what you were trying to teach us with your friend Paul in the book of Romans, help us to understand the issues between Jews and Gentiles and why it was such a big deal in the days of Paul is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the basic question is this. Should Gentiles be required to go through all the regular um, ceremonial stuff, the circumcision and everything else, before they can become full Christians? Well, we know a number of former Pharisees who had since become Christians. And notice this, I have documentation for that, Acts 15, verse 5. But some of the believers who, had be who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. So they were pretty clear on what they thought, weren't they? Before you Do get any further, could you give um, a definition of the significance of what uh, a ceremony is? Okay, ceremonies are are religious. It, it, we're fo I mean, a ceremony can be almost anything, but in terms of religious things, there are things that that a church does or a group does to celebrate the fact that they have this particular set of beliefs. Um, rituals. Rituals sometimes. Baptism, marriage, uh, funerals. Um, the Lord's Supper, those are, those are ceremonies. Okay. Um, they, were, they were convinced that if Gentiles were allowed to become Christians too easily, the number of Gentiles in the Christian church would soon outweigh the number of Jewish Christians. Was that a real threat? For sure. Absolutely, it was true. So they were trying to make it harder? They wanted, they, wanted, they wanted Christianity to be a subset of Judaism. They wanted it to be a, you know, like a little part of Judaism. We have all of Judaism, and now we've added something to it, Christianity. So they wanted to make them Jews. They wanted them to be, if you wanted to be a Christian, they said you have to be fully Jewish first, then you can be a Christian. They wanted more Christians without losing any Jews. Yeah. <laughs> to maintain their identity. Yeah. Now, do you think they might have had a, a theological problem, or do they, you think it was just a matter of keeping their power? Because how do you, how do you really deal with the stuff that was told to be done in the Old Testament? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it's, it doesn't mean anything anymore, mm -hmm. you know? Because it's so. not the doing, it's the meaning of what they were doing. And the meaning being lost, you had to throw it away because it was going to be believed falsely f from that point forward. Well, yeah, that's the way you look at it, but it, it what is. about it them? Is I, the reason we know that is because what Jesus brought in in terms of rituals, mm, God doesn't change which means that whatever Jesus brought them was what those rituals were supposed to have taught them, but they had corrupted them. But you know, Jesus didn't talk too positively about the Sabbath any time. Right. He was, most he every time he, he, he was saying, back Sabbath. off, back off. Yeah. And he, so, he wasn't, so... He wasn't speaking against the Sabbath, he was speaking against the way they were keeping the Sabbath. Exactly. That's true, but, but there's no place where he's affirming it that much. Mm -hmm. Everything you hear about him talking about it, he's telling them to back off. Yeah. And so... Look at the spirit of the law, not at the law 
Yeah. The letter of the law is really what Jesus was saying. Well, and when, and when so you say that... you're talking about doing... You're talking about all the things they had added to... Yeah. Not the real law, not God, what God said, but all the things they had tried to add. The Mishnah stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, who were the Christians that had been, been Pharisees? Well, we don't have a list of the names. Can you think of who's the most important Pharisee who became a Christian? Gamaliel. Well, he became a Christian. We don't know Paul. that he became a Christian. We're talking about once he became a Christian. Well, oh, yeah. There's uh, Joseph. Uh, Very Mathia. Nicodemus. 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 Oh. Those are good names, but <laughs> who's the most important Pharisee that became a Christian? Did Paul. Paul, of well, course. Of course we <laughs> So what we have here is one Pharisee, former Pharisee arguing against other former Pharisees about how they should keep their Christianity. So we need to keep that in mind. This is Pharisee versus Pharisee. Okay. Not a whole lot of difference in the Christian Hutus and the Tutsis, was it? Yeah. Huh? They were Christians. They were median, and, and one one faction was uh, blood yeah. out for the others. Mm -hmm. Well, we should remember that Simon, who gave the feast for Jesus in Jesus' honor on Friday night before the crucifixion, was a Pharisee. Quite likely that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus also had been Pharisees. They were related to, they were nieces and nephew of, of Simon. Um, remember that the Pharisees, the Sadducees were a very small group, a very close-knit group of wealthy people who controlled what, what was going on in the temple. That's, and they basically bought from the Romans the privilege of being high priest and controlling things in the sanctuary. That's what the, that's the Sadducees. So when the when the temple was destroyed in AD seventy, the fa the Sadducees just they had no no further reason to exist. They just disappeared. But the Pharisees, they were never allowed. And I don't know who made this rule at what point. But the Pharisees were never allowed to be more than six thousand. So that was so in terms of the millions that were Jews, six thousand was still a pretty small number of Pharisees. Well, looking back at the Old Testament, places like Leviticus, it's pretty easy to realize that um, there are multitudes of rules and laws on various topics, most of which were related to what kind of things? Do you remember? The ceremonies at the temple. How you sacrifice, when do you have to bring a lamb? How do you do it? How do you sacrifice that lamb? What does the priest do, etc.? So most of those rules were directly connected with worshiping at the temple. And Jesus told, I'm not Jesus, God told um, the children of Israel that they were allowed to work and how they were allowed to, to do all those ceremonies in how many different places? One. Only at the temple. That was the only place. They weren't allowed to offer sacrifices in Galilee somewhere. If you wanted to offer a lamb as a sacrifice, you had to come to Jerusalem. There was a way to reduce all the sacrifices that they were offering on top of every mountain, at the base of every yeah. big tree. And God put, uh, slowed it down. Yeah. So when, when did they, when was that started as far as being in Jerusalem all the time? For the well, sacrifices? under David. Under David? Yeah, David is the one who conquered the Jebusites and established Jerusalem as the new headquarters for... And so there are no sacrifices anywhere else after that? No. No, not supposed to be. Right. There, there were, and, and where, when, when, the, when the country split up, then uh, Jeroboam tried to get people to sacrifice in Bethel and, and Dan, remember, and set up those sacrificial places, but that was not God's plan. Well, coming back to the Pharisees now, um, they believed that these, if a person wants to be a Christian, they've got to follow all those Jewish ceremonies. Well, now, try to think about that for a moment. If you live in, outside of Jerusalem, how difficult is it to go to the temple and worship there and follow the ceremonies? Relatively easy, right? What if you live in Rome? Tough. If the only place you're allowed to sacrifice a lamb for the forgiveness of your sins is in Jerusalem and you live in Rome, 
Well, some people made a big deal out of pig, pilgrim mages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but I mean, you, if, if you were lucky, you could do that once in your life. Mm -hmm. so if yeah, you were but lucky. The same thing is true for those like Simon of Cyrene. He was probably there, or certainly the eunuch Ethiopian was there, uh, yeah. all the way from <laughs> Ethiopia. Yeah, think about it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, we know about the general conference, the first general conference session that was held in Jerusalem in Acts 15, and they concluded at the end of that what? Remember roughly? We should probably just look at that real quickly. Um, then the apostles and the elders, together with the whole church, decided to choose some men from the group and send them to Antioch. Remember, that's where the controversy had, had risen because of Paul and Barnabas' work up there. Um, and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose two men who were highly respected by the believers, Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas. And where do we hear about Silas later? You accompanied Paul. You accompanied Paul, exactly, on the second missionary journey, maybe the third one. And they sent the following letter by them. We, the apostles and the elders, your brothers, send greetings to all our brothers of Gentile birth who live in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. We have heard that some who went from our group have troubled and upset you by what they said. They had not, however, sent, um, received any instruction from us. And so we have met together and have all agreed to choose some messengers and send them to you. They will go with our dear brother, dear friends of Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives in the service of our Lord Jesus Christ. We send you then Judas and Silas, who will tell you in person the same things we are writing. The Holy Spirit and we have agreed not to put any other burden on you besides these necessary rules. Eat no food that has been offered to idols. Eat no blood. Eat no animal that has been strangled, and keep yourself from sexual immorality. You will do well if you take care not to do these things with our best wishes. So, uh, is that the new um, basic gospel there? What are they trying to accomplish by setting down those rules? Do you know? Pretty much what they had before. That, well, was, these these rules were to make it possible for Gentiles to go to church with Jews without being completely disruptive. The Jews would go, wouldn't go near someone who did these things. So these rules have nothing to do with the gospel per se. They have they have to do with sitting next to a Jew in church. It's almost like a lifestyle. No. In other words, go to church and don't yuck out your your, um, <laughs> your neighbor. Your neighbor, yeah. Okay. Well, these new converts felt quite comfortable. These these former uh, Jews practicing the traditions and rules from the Old Testament, which they had grown up with, including many rules that had been added to tradition and were not in the Old Testament. They did not see a conflict between practicing these Jewish rituals and being Christian. But the new Gentile converts who had not grown up with these customs and practices, and Paul had been teaching the Gentiles that it was not necessary for them to adopt those practices in order to become Christians. Fortunately, after a very detailed debate which took some time, the church leaders in Jerusalem agreed that Gentiles could become Christians without being circumcised or following many of the other ceremonial requirements of the Old Testament. So, you know, Paul probably gave them advice what to do if you go visit a Jew. So that probably happened. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we've already pointed out the fact that, you know, if you're, if you're one of these Christians from Asia Minor or Rome or Greece or Corinth or one of those places, you couldn't get to, I mean, you couldn't physically do this. I mean... You know, every time you want to have your sins forgiven, you have to travel to Jerusalem? I mean, think about it. So, um, 
This raises another question. If, if, if Christians are going to be allowed to become, I mean, if, if Gentiles are going to be allowed to become Christians without becoming fully Jews, circumcision and all that kind of stuff, this raises another question. Are any of the rules or laws which were given in the Old Testament still obligatory for Christians even today? Well, the concepts are. The concepts. Okay, can you think of an example? You mean an Old Testament concept? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Do we Seventh-day Adventists believe there are some Old Testament concepts that are still important? Well, what we eat. Mm -hmm. Food. Clean foods and unclean. The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments the is ten the commandments. obvious thing in terms of you're going to be just very brief about it, yeah. Jeez. So have do we did, did God intend for us to give up on the Ten Commandments? Well, the Ten Commandments is a huge concept driver. Mm -hmm. What do you think Paul had in do you think Paul was had the Ten Commandments in mind when he wrote the book of Romans? Think so. Yeah. Hmm? I would think so. Yeah. He said, Romans 3, verse 31, does this nullify the law of God? God forbid. Absolutely not. God forbid. So in the times of the New Testament, uh, instead of looking back at the requirements set forth in the Old Testament, the Christian church looked instead to the life, teachings, and death of Jesus as their model. Thus, the first question to be resolved in the minds of potential Christians was this one. Do you accept Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, the Son of the living God? Remember what Paul said to the jailer? They answered, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. Boy, it, that's way too easy, right? Well, what else would they look towards is for guidance because there was no re New Testament then. No. So, and I'm sure that the the people bringing the gospel didn't have it exactly the same as far as um, hmm. wisdom of the gospel. So if the, some of the rules from the Old Testament are still binding, then the question is, how should those rules impact our lives today? I find it interesting that the less educated people and even the less educated disciples were the ones who were most attracted to those cultural rules, so to speak. Whereas Paul, who had this high level education, found a way to liberate himself from those rules in so many ways without rejecting everything, as we just said, but still uh, some of those that are particularly cultural in nature, he managed to just bounce them off. We have something else now, something much better. So how did, how did Paul make that decision? Because that's going to be a key issue as he works his way through the book of Romans and what he said in Galatians already. Well, what do you think that they did in church when they gathered? together. What did they talk about? Well, obviously they studied the scriptures. That would be the one Old of the main Testament? things. With, that with the a new Testament. paradigm. Yeah, with a new paradigm, which is what Paul discovered. Mm -hmm. So they were they were studying the Old Testament. Yeah, but Paul now they had an example of Christ. Yes. And then they got off they got yeah, off but, base. But what are they reading for the example of Christ except for what what well, people first hand heard. experience at that point. Yeah. Well who? Paul never saw Christ. Mm. Yeah. Um, but they had reports. I mean that's obviously well, and, and you you can't say that. Uh, Paul probably saw and may have heard Christ in the temple. He may not have agreed you with can Paul. Only at speculate that point. on that. Well, if he was against the Christians because he had knowledge of the Christians, he didn't like. Why? He had it directly from Christ. Where else could he have gotten it? Well, Christ I was the only one. Vision, if I, think else. He's, <laughs> I think he spent a lot of time with the, the apostles. He probably asked them a lot of questions. Not the apostles, but the disciples. Mm -hmm. well, he probably he asked them a lot of I questions. Yeah, and yeah. They probably heard a lot of the stories. That reminds me when Jesus did this. And he probably listened to all that. 
Mm -hmm. So. Paul said he got it directly from um, Christ, so. Yeah. And he spent his time out there in Arabia for how many years before he actually did any preaching and teaching? Almost 10 years. Yeah. What do we do? We send a guy to Bible college and six months later you give him, give him a pastorate. Yeah. You know, that's. Well, then, you end up, then you end up with texts like Romans 3.25 and 26, yeah. mistranslated. Yeah. Well. They translated the way they thought they wanted. Well, of it to course, sound. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Because you know, you're you're there's a God out there, and you've probably done something to offend Him. And what can you get do to get back in His good graces? Yeah, change his, change God's mind. Well, Paul seems to be suggesting in the Book of Romans that keeping the commandments would be the result of our relationship with Jesus Christ, and not the source of salvation or a requirement for salvation. Now, how do, we, how do we figure that out? Well, the real stickler for modern Christians, especially Seventh-day Adventists, is the argument about the Seventh-day Sabbath. While the Sabbath commandment is certainly part of the Ten Commandments given from Mount Sinai, to our Christian friends, it seems much more like one of the ceremonial requirements. While they can see logical reasons for observing the other Nine Commandments, they do not see a logical reason for observing the Sabbath. Thus, they regard strict Sabbath observance as le observers as legalists. So we see that the basic issues troubling the early church are still present in our church today. Well, there's a lot of verses in the New Testament suggesting that we should keep the commandments. I mean, Jesus said many times, if you love me, keep my commandments, didn't he? Many times in the book of John, Matthew 5, 17 and 18, 22, 34 to 40, Revelation 12, 17, and 14, 12, etc. Do these verses refer specifically to the keeping of all the Ten Commandments or to the entire writings of the Book of Moses, thus including the observance of the seven-day Sabbath, or not? So, when Paul said the law, what did he have in mind? The Ten Commandments. Okay, anything more than that? At all, he thought. To a Jew today, if you say Torah, what does he think of? The law. Okay. And the five books of Moses, which are known as the Torah, aren't they? So, um, God, re here's what Ellen White says about that issue <coughs> God requires perfection of his children. His law is a transcript of his own character, and it is the standard of all character. This infinite standard is presented to all that there may be no mistake in regard to the kind of people whom God will have to compose his kingdom. The life of Christ on earth was a perfect expression of God's law, and when those who claim to be children of God become Christ-like in character, they will be obedient to God's commandments. Then the Lord can trust them to be of the number who shall compose the family of heaven. Clothed in the glorious apparel of Christ's righteousness, they have a place at the king's feast. They have a right to join the blood-washed throng. So, why is this really important? It says the Ten Commandments are a transcript of God's character. It says love for God, love for your fellow man is the basic essence of Christianity, right? And if you want to be in part of, king, of the kingdom of heaven, you got to learn to live according to those rules. So in Romans 5.10, Paul says we are healed by Jesus, by the study of Jesus' life, of course. Basically. In John 17, uh, eternal life is to know the Father and Jesus Christ to whom he has sent. Mm -hmm. And then, then I suggested that means they also read the rest of the Bible in light of the character of, uh, of Jesus who is representing the Father. Mm -hmm. If we have a false image of God, we have a false image of love. Yep. And therefore, we have a false image of life. <laughs> all, one, one, all one big package. Well, okay. I think that the Ten Commandments is a, is a true image of God. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm not quite sure if it'll ever be the true image of us. It, no, it'll be our direction, our light. Yes, it's a direction. But I don't know what she means about perfect. It's an perfect. offer. Perfection is an offer. It's, it's, yeah, that's, it's a, it's a promise from God. Yeah, it's a promise. Required okay. Perfection. Okay, so now we have these two issues. 
Acts 15 says, the Holy Spirit and we have agreed not to put any other burden on you ex besides these necessary rules. Necessary for salvation or necessary for what? Get along with Jews. Acts 15, yeah. Okay. Acts 16, 31, one chapter later, says what? All you have to do is believe, right? There it is. They answered, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. What do you mean by believe? Well, the word it's a word for faith, pistis. See, the thing is, it says believe like Jesus, not so much believe in Jesus as we translate the term. I think we're called to learn to think as he does, having you the faith of Jesus, which is the belief system of Jesus, having you the mind of Christ. So uh, the emphasis needs to be on how Christ thinks, and we should learn to think as he does, which is love. Mm -hmm. But you can't start that unless you believe that Jesus exists. He's the model of that love. That he was the Son of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, Adventists of the 21st century have tried to walk a fine line between those contrasting views, suggesting that the moral law was never be, has never been changed and is required of all peoples, while the ceremonial restrictions pointing forward to the death of Christ are no longer required. Adventists assert that those who keep the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath, are not legalists, but are practicing righteousness by faith. Do we have a solid basis for saying that? Well, before we go too far down that pathway, we should consider the following words from Paul and then from some words from Ellen White. Galatians 3, 19-24. This is the this is the crux of the book of, Ru of Galatians. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added in order to show what wrongdoing is, and it was meant to last until the coming of Abraham's descendant to whom the promise was made. And then verse 23, But before the time for faith came, the law kept us all locked up as prisoners until this coming faith should be revealed. And so the law was in charge of us until Christ came in order that we might then be put right with God through faith. The law protects us while we learn to do what is right. Consider the following from Ellen White. He, God, did not even then trust his precepts to the memory of a people who were prone to forget his requirements, but wrote them upon tables of stone. He would remove from Israel all possibility of mingling heathen traditions with his holy precepts or of confounding his requirements with human ordinances or customs. But he did not stop with giving them the precepts uh, of right. Hold on, the precepts of the deck of the Decalogue, I'm sorry. The people had shown themselves so easily led astray that he would leave no door of temptation unguarded. Moses was commanded to write as God should bid him judgments and laws giving minute instruction as to what was required. These directions relating to the direct duty of the people to God, to one another, and to the stranger were only the principles of the Ten Commandments amplified and given in a specific manner that none need or. They were designed to guard the sequence of the Ten Commandments engraved on the tables of stone. Okay, and here's a very challenging passage. How do you understand this one? If man had kept the law of God as given to Adam after his fall, preserved by Noah and observed by Abraham, there would have been no necessity for the ordinance of circumcision. And if the descendants of Abraham had kept the covenant of which circumstance, circumcision was a sign, they would never have been seduced into idolatry, nor would it have been necessary for them to suffer a life of bondage in Egypt. They would have kept God's law in mind, and there, should, and there would have been no necessity for it to be proclaimed from Sinai, engraved upon the tables of stone. And had the people practiced the principles of the Ten Commandments, there would have been no need of the additional directions given to Moses. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 364, paragraph 1 and 2. 
It's a pretty potent, incredible statement, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, um, I am asked, Ellen White, this is Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 233, paragraph 1. I am asked concerning the law in Galatians. What law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ? I answer both the ceremonial and the moral code of Ten Commandments. Um, was that popularly recognized in, in the early Adventist church? How about today? Oh. Well, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. This is a, the next couple of paragraphs. That we might be justified by faith. In this scripture, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle is speaking especially of the moral law or the Ten Commandments. So these passages suggest that we all, that all law, including the moral law, was added because we needed it. All law is an emergency measure. So how can we say, how can we make a statement like that? All law is an emergency measure? Isn't, if we redefine, or let's define the term, or what a law is, and law, if law is a, a description, it's a prescription uh, and not a proscription. Mm -hmm. And if, if the law defines how all intelligent creatures will conduct themselves for eternity, uh, then uh, it, that statement, if it's fine, but you don't have to put emergency measure because in the grand scheme of things, there really is not an emergency. Uh, it, it's 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 uh, if you don't have a big enough picture, you, then you think, well, an emergency rose. But God is not caught by surprise at, at any level. He, the plan was bef was made. Bef uh, we call the plan of salvation before any intelligent creatures were created. So, I think we get kind of off into a ditch there. Well. This was one of the major crisis issues at the 1888 General Conference. It is so easy for church members and organizations to focus on what people do rather than what they are. You know, some of you have been to General Conference sessions, I'm sure, mm -hmm. and what do they report on? <laughs> how many do. churches we have built, how many new baptisms we've done, the number of lessons maybe we've prepared, other things. But these are things that people do, right? We want to tell the world that we're we're growing. But what are the people thinking? Mm -hmm. What what, is, what are the well, actually people actually being taught? Are they t being taught to how to how to understand these lessons, or are they just going through the motions once a week? No worse than that, are they doing it to be saved? Yeah, <laughs> which is righteousness by works. Or doing what's right because it's right and not because of a promise of a reward or a threat it's of not money. not from the heart. It's from oh. obedience, which is a word I think we need to think about a whole lot because obedience does not change the heart. It makes us better law-abiding citizens, but doesn't make us better people. Mm. But if you define uh, uh, obedience as a, a willingness to listen or take instruction, and the preamble to that, you've checked out this person that you're going to take lessons from and it, if he's worthy worth has worthship uh, worthy of worship then it makes some sense because you've you've reasoned it out you've checked it out and that's one way of looking at it anyway mm -hmm. well how do you measure how well the gospel is being spread throughout the world numbers very very challenging especially if you talk about a singular gospel mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah well those who have studied the books of Moses very carefully have divided the, the, those five books into, the laws in those five books into five categories. Moral law, ceremonial law, civil law, statutes and judgments, and health laws. Okay? If one looks through these laws and considers them carefully, it will be obvious that there is uh, considerable overlap. It should also be obvious that in order to, for one to comply with many of these re regulations, one, he had to be able to go to the sanctuary in Jerusalem. Two, he had to live under a theocracy and he must be prepared to kill animals as a part of his religious worship. Think you could do that? Yeah, and the word theocracy is misleading anyway. Because we usually mean it to imply 
that there is humans who impose God's laws on other humans, which is not what a theocracy is. Mm -hmm. A true theocracy is the person having that relationship with God that transforms them directly from that relationship, yeah. not because they're under pressure from other humans to, to do whatever. Yeah. So what, what does law mean in that? What does law mean? Yeah. Well, in, in scientific terms, law means something that always applies. The law of gravity. You, you, you don't have a way of, if you've traveled with, what are those things called outside? They're now outside the oh. Voyager 1 and 2 that have, have left apparently the sphere of this sun. Uh, yeah, it's escape velocity. Yeah. I get in this. Okay, but um, when you talk about those kind of laws, if I take a rock and drop it, the rock doesn't have any choice. It's going mm -hmm. to drop. Whereas we are freedom, we are free people to decide what, what to do. Mm -hmm. but so we've got, we've got the law of physics and we've got the law of God, mm -hmm. which we make a decision every time we do those laws. Whereas the physics one doesn't make a decision, it just does it. So we got, we got two kinds of laws there. Mm -hmm. Well, not really, because you have a law that produces life, and there's a law that produce, produces death. Mm -hmm. There's a way that seemeth right unto man, it produces death, which the converse is, there's a way that may not seem right to man, but it produces life. What doesn't seem right to man? Live for others. <laughs> not, that's not what we but were created to do. it's all a decision, though, that you make. <laughs> well, living but for the, others the laws, is the law of life. But the laws for physics, there's no decision being made there. It just does it. So we've got, we've got two things uh, that we're thinking still, about if here. You're gonna, if you're going to build um, an airplane, you better pay attention to those laws. And <laughs> well, that's true, <laughs> because it doesn't make a decision. It just does it. That you, you're yeah. not seeing the my scientists point. Scientists are the ones who that have people. <laughs> people look at the law of God and they make a decision on whether to do it or not. Whereas the stuff on physics, it doesn't make a decision. It just does once it. Once that decision's made, it is like the law of physics. After after no, that's why no. right now we're in the experiment I'm not saying of the great afterwards or before. I'm just saying that. But yeah, we're all on li we're all on different. life support right now, because what has happened shouldn't it doesn't go with God's uh, how He operates, and this is all on life support, letting the great controversy play out. So, so once we, that is all settled, it is like the law of physics. So when we have the law, when we actually are perfect, we won't. We won't have a decision anymore. That when it comes to not telling the truth, we won't have the choice to not tell the truth anymore. We oh, yes. will tell the choice. Oh yes, we will we still be free. We will still be free, but we okay. won't. We, we won't want to. See, and that's still making my point. You've got two kinds of laws. When the rock falls, he doesn't. The rock doesn't have a choice. No, but there are two sides to freedom. There's the positive, constructive, loving side of freedom. There's the destructive side you of freedom. Make a decision you to decide go one to stay the other. on the one. But with the rock, it's going to go to the gravity all the time. Mm -hmm. well, there's so there's no decision. The there's so no will choice the airplane in the if it's not created to respect the law that keeps it up in the air. It's not making a decision, it's <laughs> Oh, the people it's made a decision. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, we need to move on. Christians okay. of that time <laughs> believed and we believe that the Messiah has come, lived and died, Christ. Yeah. In the strictest sense of the word, the theocracy disappeared when the Hebrews chose Saul as their first king. And certainly, when the last temple to exist was destroyed in AD 70, along with the destruction of Jerusalem, that made the strict keeping of all the rules given long ago by Moses impossible. So what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to go to Jerusalem to offer our sacrifices? The, the laws are in there. When asked about the law and which was the most important part of the law, Jesus replied, 
Love for God and love for your neighbor, right? Matthew 22, 34 to 40. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and Leviticus 19, 18. A pundit by the name of Ambrose Bierce defined a Christian as, quote, one who believes that the New Testament is a divinely inspired book admirably suited to the spiritual needs of his neighbor. <laughs> not ad, not ad, 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 admirably suited to my needs, but to the spiritual needs of my neighbor. Okay? So where does that leave us? If Christians are saved by faith, should they act differently from worldlings? Should these differences be, avail be obvious in our behavior? They should. Returning to the background for the writing of the Book of Romans, it is easy to get hung up on the horns of a dilemma. Since the days of Martin Luther, many Christians have believed that we are saved by faith alone. But like the former Pharisees turned Christians in Paul's day, modern Christians, including Seventh-day Adventists, have a long list of do's and don'ts. Is it possible that God once instructed his people to carry out all these rules and then later for some reason God changed his mind? Well, we have this verse, Israel's majestic God does not lie or change his mind. He is not a human being. He does not change his mind. 1 Samuel 15, 29. Of course, in verses 10 and 11 in that chapter and verses 31 in that chapter, it says it repented of him that he had made Saul king. So, uh, what do you do with that? Okay, so now, what, what have we got? The context here. Was Paul at the meeting of the general, the first meeting of the general conference in, in Jerusalem? Was Paul there? Anybody remember? Yes. Yeah, he was there, of course. He, along with the others, recognized that these, those requirements, avoiding sexual immorality, avoiding meat offered to idols, avoiding eating meat with animals that ha from animals that have been strangled, and avoiding the eating of blood, would help to keep peace in the Christian congregations to which, the, to which he ministered. Those rules really had nothing to do with salvation itself, but simply how former Jews and former Gen Jew Gentiles were able to get along in church. A few years later, back in the field working among Gentiles, Paul made it very clear that eating food offered to idols, what was the first requirement that we read back in Acts 15? Do you remember? Mm. Um, first one, eat no food that has been offered to idols. Did Paul have anything to say about that later? Sure did. <laughs> and? It was impractical for some people. Okay. Those rules really had nothing to do with salvation itself. So a few years later, back in the field working among Gentiles, Paul made it very clear that eating food offered to idols was a matter of personal opinion and that those idols could not affect the food in any way. And we'll spend some time on that, Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 coming up. Very interesting study. Paul had carefully worked with church leadership during the conference in Jerusalem. However, when it came to the actual practice of those rules, Paul demonstrated that he believed that the logic of what is right trumped even the decisions of church leadership. Oh dear. <laughs> is that true? What was Paul teaching out there in Corinth? Eat whatever you want from the meat market, right? Remember what it says? First Corinthians ten twenty five. Well, Paul had met these issues straight head on in the church in Galatia. 
And Paul wanted to make certain that these prob this problem did not arise in the church in Rome. Paul even went so far as to suggest that the converted Gentiles, who had previously done the terrible things described in Romans 1, were less sinful than the former Jews described in Romans 2. Why would he say that? I mean, he was one of those former Jews, right? So why would he say they were less sinful than the former Gentiles? Anybody get any idea? Is it because the Jews looked at the Gentiles and said, those scum that heathen bunch of people? What was their, what was their problem? It's bigotry. Their attitude. Those former Jews who had become Christians were so ready to judge their fellow believers who had been Gentiles. Oh, you know, you can't sit next to me. Well, look at some verses from the Old Testament now. Clear back in the Old Testament. Look at Deuteronomy 10, 16. So then, from now on, be obedient to the Lord and stop being stubborn. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. The Lord your God will give you and your descendants obedient hearts so that you will love him and with all your heart and you will continue to live in that land. And Jeremiah 4, verse 4. Keep your covenant with with keep your covenant with me your lord and dedicate yourselves to me you people of judah and jerusalem if you don't my anger will burn like fire against burn like fire because of the evil things you have done it will burn and there will be no one to put it out so i mean it's pretty clear back from the old testament these verses suggest that the real circumcision has something to do not with the foreskin of an external organ but with the mind and heart where we do our most involved thinking. What does it mean to be circumcised of heart? You all getting ready to study the book of Romans know precisely what that means, right? Circumcised in the heart. Does that mean we tie up part of the atrium or the atria or the ventricles? Means you control your heart. Okay. Control your emotions. You mm -hmm. Do the right thing. Okay, here's my question for you. One, a new Christian sees all the things that his church seems to require of him. He comes to understand that those things are required for salvation. He believes that he must pay tithe, keep the Sabbath, practice health reform, avoid alcohol and tobacco, live a morally upright life, etc., in order to be saved. His Christianity consists of a long series of battles with the natural tendencies of the heart in order to try to do those things. He might even become exhausted and depressed. Okay, that's scenario one. Scenario number two. A second Christian after carefully studying his New Testament, falls in love with Jesus because of what Jesus has done for him. His earnest desire is to understand God more fully and correctly and to follow Christ's example as far as possible. He does this not because he believes he's required to do so, but because he wants to be like his Lord. He may do all the same things that his friend in scenario one does, but he does them for very different reasons. Does that matter? Sure does. Why? If you do what the law says, salvation by works. Mm -hmm. If you do it out of persuasion, which is the same persuasion, that was Christ's persuasion. You do it not just out of love for Christ, but out of love for humanity. And it becomes a natural gesture to do it naturally, thus you're free, as opposed to be bound. If you came to church and those two people came to church and sat down beside each other, do you think you could tell the difference between them? No. Nope. Probably not. I also th think uh, in heaven no one uh, is going to be exhausted and depressed. No. So. That's exactly right. That's why this the scenario one people are not going to be there. Well, look at Drop back to Galatians and see if we can understand a little bit more of this information. Galatians 1. From Paul, who is called to be an apostle, did not come from human beings or by human means, 
but from Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the death, from death. So Paul believes that his message has come from whom? Christ. All the brothers and sisters who are here join me in sending greetings to the churches of Galatia. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. In order to set us free from this present evil age, Christ gave himself for our sins in obedience to the will of God and Father. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The one gospel. I am surprised at you. In no time at all, this is Paul writing to the Galatians now, I am surprised at you. In no time at all, you are deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are accepting another gospel. Actually, there is no other gospel. But I say this because there are some people who are upsetting you and trying to change the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel that is different from the one we preached to you, may he be condemned to hell. Does that mean that he has pretty strong convictions about this? <laughs> We've said it before and now I say it again. If anyone preaches to you a gospel that is different from the ones you one you accepted, um, may he be condemned to hell. Does this sound as if I'm trying to win human approval? Not exactly, huh? No indeed, what I want is God's approval. Am I trying to be popular with people? If I was still doing, trying to do so, I would, have, I would not be a servant of Christ. Okay, so, if one, if one continues reading in the book of Galatians through chapter 3, one will discover that Paul clearly believed that the law had a continuing function for Christians. And what's the function for Christians in, in chapter 3 of Galatians? What's it the function of law? Eyes. It hmm? opens our eyes on our okay. condition. And anything else? Remember, Grace, Galatians 3 says the law is supposed to bring us to Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay? Show you about him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But if one continues reading, the, oh, anyway, yeah, the law is to protect us, guide us, and to bring us to Christ. All of this leaves many people confused. There was a great deal of confusion over the question at the Seventh-day Adventist General Conference session in 1888. In Paul's day, to a considerable extent, the issue was a matter of pride for Jewish Christians. Why? They were very concerned that the Christian church would soon become a predominantly Gentile church. Did that happen? Sure did. Absolutely. And thus it would lose its Jewish distinctiveness, and they were right. Be honest now. Why is it so easy for many people to slip into legalism? How do you convince new converts to the Seventh-day Adventist Church of the importance of Sabbath-keeping, tithe-paying, health-reforming, etc., without it being somewhat legalistic? Can we make it clear to people who are not Adventists, but who, who are thinking about even considering the Adventist Church, can we make it clear that those rules that we have are for our best good, and it'll be for their best good, as opposed to just a legalistic requirement? Do we know how to do that? Do we believe that Sabbath keeping is important? Do we believe that tithe paying is important? Do we believe health reform is important? Yes, we do. I, I always smile to myself when I think about that because I've been an Adventist all my life. I grew up in an Adventist family, been a vegetarian all my life, basically. And um, people come to me at the clinic who are my age and they say, how do you look so young? Mm -hmm. When it comes to tithe, I think it's interesting to avoid the word paying tithe because we don't pay tithe, we don't give tithe, return. we return mm -hmm. tithe. It was God's all along. Yeah. Be honest now. Why is it so easy for many people to slip into legalism? How do we convince new converts to the Seventh-day Adventist Church of the importance of Sabbath-keeping, tithe-paying, health-reforming, etc.? without appearing somewhat legalistic? Mm 
Do we understand the truth of the gospel so clearly that we can spell those issues out without confusion when talking to new believers or even to those who have not yet become Christians? Or do we, or do we lay unnecessary burdens on people when they become Christians? To those who accept and seek to follow the larger view, great controversy, trust healing model of the plan of salvation, these issues are core to our beliefs. We wish very much that Seventh-day Adventists around the world would understand the correct reasons for doing what they do and what the church recommends. And do those things, beca and do those things because they want to and not because they think they're required to. So what is your motive for being a Christian and a Seventh-day Adventist? Here's one incredible statement from Ellen White. We've looked at it before, but I'll read it once again. All true obedience comes from the heart. In other words, you do it because you want to, right? You believe it's the right thing to do. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. How can we as Christians move from being basically selfish as the way we're born to having that kind of an attitude. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Desire of Ages 668, paragraph 3. I'm going to challenge you, now that we've sort of laid down the, the background material, as we go through the rest of the Book of Romans and the next series of, rest of this series of lessons, look at it carefully. Think about what Paul would say to our church in our day. Think about what Jesus would say to our church in our day. He's coming back very soon, as we know, and he's not going to be just, you know, oh well, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. It will be a very definite distinction between those who are on his side and those who are not on his side, and we need to make sure that we are on his side. This series of lessons is very important for that reason. Our kind and wonderful Father, it is with humble hearts that we bow before you as we seek to understand better this great book of Romans. Help us to read it, to understand it, and thus be drawn near to you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.